It's estimated that around 40,000 Lethbridge residents do not have a family doctor. You can include me in that group. But there's some good news in that three international graduate physicians have signed contracts to come to our city and another seven are pending. To discuss this in more detail is Lethbridge East MLA Nathan Newdorf. Nathan, that would mean 10 extra physicians for 40,000 people. I mean, it's really not enough, but at least it's a good start, right? Absolutely, Hal. It's, it's not a start. We didn't get here in a day and we won't fix it in a day, but it is definitely positive direction. And I understand that there have been uh, discussions with five to seven more doctors beyond that, that first group of 10. Uh, so we're very hopeful to be approaching 20 possibly by the end of the year uh, on contract and we continue to work uh, towards that number. We'll need approximately uh, 30 to 40 doctors to recover the number uh, of people that uh, lost a family physician over the past couple of years. So it's a step in the right direction. And just for um, clarity, there was, there's was probably 10 to 12,000 individuals in Lethbridge prior to uh, this decline in the number of doctors who never had a family physician. So we're trying to recover possibly 30,000 people that are now without a family physician that had one before. So this is almost a third of the way there, and uh, it's definitely a, a move in the right direction. So what caused such a lack of doctors here in our city? Was it that a lot just moved out, some retired? What's the issue here? It's a little bit of everything. Uh, we know quite a group of doctors have moved to larger cities in Alberta, Calgary and Edmonton in particular. Uh, many have retired. Uh, the additional stress and workload of a pandemic. Uh, just saw a number of doctors say that they had reached the end of their careers. Unfortunately, a number of uh, physicians actually passed away. Uh, that's, that's a natural occurrence as well, but unfortunate. And uh, it's just been a very difficult time with lack of movement around the globe in terms of people moving during a pandemic. Uh, so once we've seen that recovery, it's much more uh, attractive to, to have doctors come and look at a place like Lethbridge. When I lived in Hamilton, Ontario, I had a doctor from Nigeria, Dr. Oleanka Dada, wonderful man, an incredible human being and a great doctor. Are we looking at maybe opening the doors to having even more international doctors come into Canada and Alberta? Absolutely, we, we do look around the globe. Uh, one of the most important elements is to check the credentials. There's many countries around the world that have already established that their training programs would meet the requirements that we have set here in Canada for that threshold of, of safety. Uh, there are other countries where that's not necessarily the case. So it's very important to, that we keep people's safety forefront in our minds as we go through the credential recognition program for those doctors and make sure that they're eligible to practice medicine here in Canada. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about the vetting and recruiting process of bringing more physicians here to our city. Do you know what really goes into it? I don't have all the details, of course, but uh, checking the credentials is a major part of that. And it's not just uh, as simple as, as calling a, a reference on a resume. It's a little bit more in depth. Uh, they do follow up on the, the training, their course of practice. Uh, and then there's also the federal component in terms of immigration to make sure that there's not uh, criminal uh, occurrences in their past or anything like that. Um, and then their, their financial stability. We want them to come here and work and not necessarily come here to be uh, a net drain on our resources. We already take many immigrants who are in uh, very serious global consequences who need those resources to be taken care of. So, and then there's also the whole process of relocating, making sure that they find a place to live, if they have a spouse and family and children that they can go to school. So it's quite an extensive process and it can take uh, three, six, sometimes even nine or 10 months to accomplish. Nathan, the opposition NDP have been blasting the UCP recently on a number of points. One is how car insurance rates have gone through the roof since the cap was removed in 2019. Will we see a break on auto insurance, especially for our younger people? Well, it's, this is a market function. What, was, what we saw happening in 2019 when the cap was in place is that the underwriters of those insurance companies were leaving Alberta at an alarming rate. Uh, I heard many examples of young people who had to pay up to $7,000 for a single year of automobile insurance, and they had to pay it all up front because the availability just wasn't there. The risk was so great for those insurance companies. So when we removed the cap, it allowed those underwriters to come back and increase the competition, but prices did go up for everybody else as the market adjusted. We are now starting to see those same companies 
request uh, a reduction in their insurance rates. Seven companies to date, we hope more continue to follow. That's the impact and effect of competition in that market. But now we have other uh, factors that are increasing those prices. Inflation that we've seen across the country um, and the availability of replacement parts is going up and costing more because those are globally supplied and our supply management chain has taken a hit. Um, and those things, as well as the complexity of automobile manufacturing now with technology and circuits and those kind of things, even the composite materials to build vehicles, all of those push prices up, even though competition would help bring those prices down. So we're seeing a bit of that confluence in the market right now. Now, a recent report by the Business Council of Alberta says that Albertans are struggling more than any other province. While prices have gone up by about 7%, our incomes have only increased on average by about 3%. Another report, Nathan, shows that 52% of Alberta households were within $200, $200 of not making all of their financial obligations by the end of the month. So how can we make life more affordable for Albertans? Well, our government's taken a number of steps to try to do that. We've removed the gasoline tax and we have added a, a, a small rebate for natural gas prices. There's further work that we're looking into, but I think the most important factor that we can, we can do to help uh, people make ends meet is by seeing our economy recover. And we've set a great stage for that. Our economy is really taking off with diversity, with new jobs. The number one uh, concern I hear from employers is the lack of skilled trade and employees. Those things will begin to push pressure on employers to increase their wages so they can attract the help that they need. I think that's beneficial and we are starting to see that already. And that trend will continue as we get into summer and the fall, which is our busiest time of the year. So hopefully we continue to see that trend. It has been very difficult for people in Alberta for the last couple of years, for sure. Premier Kenny's mentioned on Bridge City News that as long as oil stays above 80 bucks a barrel, then Albertans can enjoy the, you know, saving on the 13% provincial tax on fuel. But let me ask you something. How hard would it be, let's say, if it drops down to $75 a barrel and all of a sudden, boom, that's a big hit for a lot of Albertans once we're used to now paying 13 cents a litre less. That'll be a shock. Well, yeah, it could be, but here's here's the brilliance of what our finance minister Travis Taves when he set this up. It's a graduated uh, tax relief. So at eighty dollars a barrel, the the tax starts to drop, and it drops incrementally until you hit ninety dollars a barrel, where that full thirteen cents is removed completely. And, and as it as prices drop, they don't drop ten or twelve dollars a barrel typically in a day. They they take a little bit of time it would also incrementally come back down there. So it'd be a graduated curve to help uh, ease that transition back and forth. But it's a, it's a great program because of that. And it's a taxation thing. It's not a rebate where it would be a hard adjustment. It's a graduated tax relief and done in a way that's wise, uh, that allows us to hit our budget targets, but also helps people adjust when those, those dollars per barrel prices change. Nathan, the UCP leadership review is ongoing. Mail and ballots must be in by May the 11th and results will be known by May the 18th. Now, if Premier Jason Kenney is out as party leader, that could be a real challenge for the UCP. How tough would it be to replace a leader like Jason Kenney, especially leading up to next year's provincial election? Uh, absolutely, it would, it would be a challenge for sure. Uh, there are very few politicians with the, the amount of experience that Premier Jason Kenney has and uh, We'd have to see the outcome of that result to know exactly how we'll move forward. Thankfully, we do have some time. Um, a year is a long time in politics, but it can also be a very short time in politics. So we'd have to definitely, we'd have our work cut out for us, that's for sure. Now, if Premier Kenny doesn't get his 50 plus one support from party members, would you ever consider putting your name forward as party leader? Well, I've had a lot of people ask me that in the last uh, month or so. Uh, I think we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Now, Premier Kenny says hydrogen is a big part of Alberta's future, which is a big reason why the province is investing around 50 million taxpayers' dollars into a new clean hydrogen centre. Is this really about diversifying our natural resources? Absolutely it is. Uh, people in Alberta have expected our government to diversify our economy, get away from the roller coaster ride of just trusting the energy prices in terms of oil and gas, as it is a, a very cyclical in nature. 
So moving into hydrogen accomplishes two things. One, it accomplishes our environmental goals of, of moving towards cleaner energy. And two, it does diversify the energy, the natural resources we have in a much cleaner way. So yes, it is about diversifying, but it has the added benefit of also moving us in the right direction environmentally. At this point, do we know where it may potentially be built? Uh, my understanding is that it's going to be somewhere near Edmonton uh, to be close to the energy producers, as well as a major uh, shipping hub uh, of Edmonton and the capital city. Uh, it could change, but I, I suspect it'll be somewhere in that, that neighborhood. As we move closer and closer to the next provincial election next year, you know, a lot of times governments like to spend money in different constituencies. Some people say, yeah, it's to help buy votes. But I mean, other times it's like certain areas really need funding for capital projects here. And we've talked about a third bridge here for the city of Lethbridge. Any other money potentially coming our way, maybe for intox and detox beds as we continue to battle the opioid crisis or a third bridge? What have you heard? Uh, well, we, we have lots of money for intox and detox beds and treatment. Uh, I look forward to that money being actually built with. Uh, there's quite a few beds in the queue, and I expect some sod turnings this year, which will definitely see that money that, that was promised earlier being spent. Uh, the third bridge, I've had a, a very good conversation with the Minister of Transportation on that. Uh, we are fortunate that the next budget will, will have to be put forward by the end of February and passed by the end of March next year, which is in advance, two months in advance. Um, I hope that we continue on our, our fiscal uh, objectives of, of continuing on a, a balanced budget and getting us back into the black. Uh, but I am also hopeful for a num number of very needed growth projects, good investment in good infrastructure here in the South that will help us continue our economic recovery. Let's discuss the province putting an extra $3.6 million into an agreement with Ottawa to support inclusive childcare for kids with special needs. How important is this kind of an investment? I think it's incredibly important. As we talked earlier, uh, allowing and helping people get back into the workplace is vital right now. And uh, parents with children with special needs and disabilities uh, need that support as well. And being able to have trusted, safe and affordable childcare uh, is crucial for them to be able to do so. I think this is a great investment. Uh, I know in Lethbridge as a, a hub city here in the South, uh, a lot of families that have uh, additional needs of services, uh, particularly community and social services, they move to Lethbridge to get those, those, those needs met. And to have that investment will really benefit us here in Lethbridge and really help those families who need that little extra help. Let's talk a bit about the school curriculum, which has been criticized extensively by educators, by parents, and of course the opposition NDP. Uh, a lot of it's rolling out in September. How do you respond to that kind of criticism when it comes to this new curriculum? Well, here's, here's where I get uh, a little bit confused with people's criticism. Most of the criticism is about the social studies aspect of that, which is still being worked on and not being implemented this fall. The mathematics and language arts where they've piloted it this year, they've seen two and three grade level increases in those children's learning. Uh, those are what are gonna be implemented this fall. So uh, people without concerns are either not getting the whole story or, or not understanding the actual benefit of what's being done. I think we've heard those concerns about the social studies. That's why we've held that back and continue to work on it. But we've heard the praise and positive reports in learning for children in the mathematics and language arts and physical education pieces. That's why we're proceeding with those. And I think parents will see a great benefit to their children in those grades this fall and into the next the years ahead. Now, Nathan, we've talked about attracting more doctors to our region. How about other business owners to help really diversify our economy here in Lethbridge? What's needed and what kind of businesses are needed here in our city? Well, I think that's why uh, news items like yours, Hal, uh, when we focus on the positive. So when people do a Google search of where they want to live and they type in Lethbridge, for years past, uh, previous, especially after the previous administration, all we saw was bad news stories. We had, uh, we still have a large challenge in our opioids and addictions uh, realm, but we've seen lots of positive investment. We've seen lots of steps in the right direction. Our new police chief is doing excellent work. In every sector of the city, we've seen crime go down. So we need to get that positive message out. So when people look to move here, we have a great college, we have a great university, we have lots of great uh, resources and facilities. 
And we've got positive news and positive growth. So it's not just agriculture and food, food production, it's shipping, receiving. Uh, we've got the exhibition park being built. We've got the airport renovation just being done. We are growing, we're a hub for the South and we've got lots more positive than we do negative, even though we have things to work on. I'm very excited about that. And I appreciate you and other news media outlets in putting forward the good news. When people look at Lethbridge, they see the good news stories. Lethbridge East MLA, Nathan Newdorf, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Hal. Take care. You as well. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless, and thanks for watching.